foolishly, like a fool, I thought, oh, no one's about today, I'll film a video, that'll be a great idea. And um, the tree surgeon just pulled up outside, so <laughs> sounds going to be even worse than usual in this one. Hello and welcome back to whatever this is. This being a very cool video for me because I just had my second paper officially published. Um, if the proof has been online for a few weeks, but this is official. This paper, which was co-authored by Mike Benton, who is one of the nicest and most knowledgeable men in paleontology, is titled Three-Dimensional Tomographic Study of the Dermal Armour from the Tail of the Triassic Eatosaur Stagenolithus robertsoni. Uh, so we, we really went in for that, like, punchy, catchy title. I'll get into, like, all the sciencey bit and what we actually did uh, in a second, but first of all, let's go and start at the beginning with what the heck is an Aetosaur? Aetosaurs were herbivorous crocodile-lion archosaurs within the Sudosuchia that lived in the middle to late Triassic, so around the same time that the dinosaurs were first starting to diversify. Uh, they're really notable for being extremely heavily armoured, so not only is the back covered in these bony osteoderms, but often the sides, the undercarriage, belly area, and even the limbs in some species are covered in these bony osteoderms. And the really cool thing about these is that they are reasonably diagnostic of species across Etosauria. So that means that you can look at the little pattern on the top of your osteoderm and say, that's a type of thorax, that's a stagionolepus, that sort of thing. The first Aetosaur known to science was originally described as a fish by a French man whose paper does not exist online in any form. He called it Stagionolepus robertsoni, and this Aetosaur came from the Elgin Sandstones of Scotland, which is convenient because it's the exact same place that the Aetosaur that I worked on came from, and in fact the Aetosaur that I worked on was Stagionolepus robertsoni. The problem with this locality is that the matrix is really, really tough, so it's a very iron-rich sandstone, but the fossils contained within it are really quite fragile. So in the past, the only way to look at these fossils has been to pretty much destroy them and then just take a cast from the mould that's left behind and look at that. So that's what the holotype is. The holotype is just a cast of a mould. Obviously, you lose a lot of information that way. I mean, you're only getting to look at one side of this thing. I mean, I suppose you could do something very clever and destroy a fossil, but that would be extremely difficult and I don't think it's been done. And then of course you lose all the internal data, which is quite useful for us nowadays. Less so when it was first described, but nowadays with all the histological studies we do, things to do with ontogeny, we quite want that internal data. It's really helpful for paleontologists. There has been at least one attempt to scan material from Elgin before, uh, and this was unfortunately unsuccessful, it's just a sort of footnote in another scientific paper. Uh, but since then, our CT scanning technology, and in particular micro CT scanning, which is even higher resolution and over a smaller area as it suggests, has really improved. And in combination with the fantastic Tom Davies from the University of Bristol, who can scan anything we have been able to successfully scan Elgin sandstone material for the first time, which is pretty cool. So, I mean, it's not entirely relevant, but how I got onto the study was uh, basically I knew I was taking up an internship in Montana in the summer and I was working in a lab in a school at, at the time, so I basically went, do you know what? <laughs> I'm a little bit bored here. I'm going to quit at Easter and then have a couple of months before I go to Montana. And then I realised I have a couple of months before I go to Montana. I should probably fill that with something useful. Uh, and this led to me emailing a bunch of people, including my old supervisor and tutor from university, Mike Benton, who I've published with in the past, and saying, is, is there anything I can do? I'm, I'm bored and available for the next two months. So... And he and pretty much everyone else got back to me and said yes, which meant that I was extremely busy and technically homeless for two months. Um, but I had, a, I had a good time. Uh, that was probably one of my favourite parts of last year. So it all worked out pretty well. So I turned up in Bristol and I was couch surfing and living in hostels and it was all a jolly good time. <laughs> and I was presented with this huge 
blob of files from the work that Tom had done to process. When you CT scan uh, an object, you get back from the machine a bunch of x-rays in little slices, like sub-millimetre distance slices, in three dimensions. So you've got a set of files going all the way across the spe specimen, going from left to right, up to down, forward to backwards. It's, it's a lot of photos and a lot of data. Sometimes you can upload that into the program you're using to process it, push a button and it essentially comes back with a beautiful model just done for you. Um, other times it's not like that. So if it's not like that, for example, the um, density between the thing that you're looking at, so a fossil in this case and a matrix, is not high enough for the computer to automatically separate or it'll be a bit fuzzy in places. Um, uh, or there's just a bunch of weird lumps, so your matrix might have a bunch of little pebbles and things in it as well that are messing with what the program thinks you actually want to look at and these little bits. Uh, so what you need to do then is spend days or potentially weeks shut in a dark lab individually drawing on the areas that you want to look at in three dimensions. And eventually, when you've done that, it will come back with a beautiful model that you can share on your social medias and looks really good. And, and you know, also like used for research purposes. Now, I didn't time myself, but I was in Bristol for almost two months. And I was in the lab for sometimes five days a week, uh, only four because I was also commuting to London to work in the imaging lab at the Natural History Museum one day a week then. And when I was in the lab in Bristol, I was doing shifts solidly for like at least four hours each time I was in there. Um, it was a time. But to show for that time, the scans came out really well and we got a really nice model that was very useful for showing the articulation pattern of these scoots, so how they interlock. And then in the second block we had, it actually had a sort of cross section of tail, so we can see how that all fits together and the general shape that it would have been, uh, which is very cool. And this is only the second time that I could find, certainly, uh, that postcranial cranial material has been scanned, so there's not a lot of data in that area to begin with. Uh, I think it would also be really cool to look internally in the scoots in the future, uh, especially from this location where we don't have any internal data whatsoever. Based on what I was seeing in the x-rays, it looked pretty interesting. Building from that, this was a really simple study um, that just gave us a lovely picture of the anatomy of a section of Etasaur and showed how these plates interlocked uh, in a way that would help this thing defend itself from other Pseudosuchians living in the area that had pointier teeth. But it has very cool implications for future work in this area, both in the CT scanning of Etasaurs and looking at their anatomy in more detail in that way, and also for the implications for how we can further study the material at Elgin that has been looked at at a very, very surface level because that's all we've been able to do. Now that we've proved that this stuff is scannable, we can look at it in a much deeper way and also save a bunch of fossils from being destroyed if someone decides they want to go and have a look at it. They can hopefully shove at least some of the material they're looking at into a CT scanner, uh, set it off and Bob's your uncle, you've got a beautiful digital model. No fossils were harmed in the making of this film. <laughs> Obviously the work doesn't stop in the lab. I had a bunch of writing that I needed to do. I did a lot of that while I was in America. And obviously there's quite a lot of time passed between the end of May, which is when I finished in the lab and started writing. I had a little bit of a gap between starting writing because I was settling into America. Um, but essentially May, June time, I started writing and then it's only just been published. If you're interested in the process of actually sort of doing the more writing side and how a paper gets published, uh, leave a comment below and I will maybe make a video on that as well because I think it's quite interesting. And I, I mean, unless you're actually publishing, uh, it's quite a mystery, I think, for a lot of people how this research actually gets out into the world. Anyway, I will leave a link down below in the description uh, to the paper if you would like to read it. 
and if you have any questions please feel free to ask me I will do my best to answer them hopefully as the person who did the research I'll be able to uh, <laughs> be a bit worrying if I couldn't but uh, yes hope you enjoyed the video the tree surgeon's back uh, and I will see you in the next one they look a little bit like a crocodile, hence why I'm wearing my Australia Zoo t-shirt. Can we just take a moment to pause and um, respect the fact that I still fit into this shirt that was bought when I was 12, 13? It was a bit big for me then, but I, I'd say this is an achievement.